Listening to the Working Poet Radio Show, where we explore the working lives of creative people. I am your announcer, Guillermo Canciobello, and that was DJ Lolo spinning some beats for your listening pleasure. Our guests tonight are critically acclaimed and international best-selling author Durf Backdurf, editor, editorial director of Abrams Comic Arts, and editor of Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Charles Kochman and actor, playwright, and comedian, John Liguizamo. This, ep this episode was sponsored by Miami Book Fair at Miami-Dade College and produced by Marcy Calabretta Canciobello. And now your host, Joseph Lappin. So you are now listening to the Working Poet Radio Show. I'm your host, Joseph Lappin, and I'm so thrilled to be back here in Miami. This is our second episode in the Magic City. Now, if you don't know about us, we're dedicated to exploring the working lives of creative people. From the nanotechnologist to the graphic novelist, to the poet, to the author, to the graphic designer, we chronicle the creative journey. We chronicle the struggles and we explore the poetry that powers their lives. So tonight we're gonna to hear from three incredible guests about their creative journeys to get to where they are, and that is at the top of their game. And I started this show because I myself, I'm a creative. And I was talking to so many other creatives about their journeys and about getting to where they wanna be with their creative life. And what I kept hearing from everybody was, how do I balance my professional life with my creative life? How do I continue to explore my passion? How do I find a way to find the heart to get up every day and sit in front of my computer? How do I find the heart to get in front of an audience and put myself out there? And what I wanted to do, the only way I could figure out how to answer those questions was to bring together professionals who have made it and hear their stories and hear their journeys. So tonight, we have Durf Backdurf, the author of Trash and My Friend Dahmer, a graphic novelist, incredible person. We have Charlie Coachman, who is the head editorial director of Abrams Comics, and we have the legendary John Lake Wazama. So tonight, we're going to be exploring their creative journey. How did they get to where they're going? How do they continue to find the strength to go forward how do they explore their own working lives? So without further ado, our announcer and more DJ Lolo. Durf Back Durf 
is the recipient of the prestigious Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award for Political Cartooning. His weekly comic strip, The City, appeared in more than 100 newspapers over the past 22 years. Give it up for Durf! Back Durf's follow-up to the critically acclaimed, award-winning, international bestseller, My Friend Dahmer, is an ode to the crap job of all crap jobs, Garbage Collector. The novel Trashed is fiction, but is inspired by Durf's own experiences as a garbage man with details interspersed about what our garbage is and where it goes. Great. One more time for Durf. <laughs> quite a, that's quite a fan base right there. Yeah, you're all, you're all faking. <laughs> is this the John Leguizamo autograph line? That's no. why I'm here. It's like, who's this loser? <laughs> so, Durf, tell me about where you're from. Because your novel is set here. Tell me about, take us all back to Ohio. Take, take it back to Ohio? Yeah. It's snowing there now. Yeah. Well, you don't really want to go back to Ohio. Um, you know, hard, hard times, uh, Rust Belt uh, towns. I grew up outside of uh, Akron, Ohio, which none of you really want to go to. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I've always lived in, uh, in the Rust Belt, except for three years here in South Florida, which... I couldn't stand it. I was miserable. It was <laughs> too much sun, too much, you know, it's like, eh, get me back to the gray skies. So how did you become a garbage man? How did you get that job? The garbage man? Yeah. I, uh, I dropped out of college, and it was the only job I could find. Yeah. So 19-year-old college dropout working for minimum wage on a garbage truck in his hometown. That became the inspiration for your new graphic novel. Can you tell us a little bit about the graphic novel and what your personal experience brought you to write that? Uh, The graphic novel is called Trashed. It is uh, fictional, actually. It's based on experience, but it's fiction. It's this rollicking, rolling comic epic about garbage men. Really, it sounds better than it. It's actually better than it sounds. And uh, it uh, it just explores this world of trash and, and with some great characters and um, I'm pretty happy with it, and it's gotten good reviews. So, but so out of all the things, how did you ever know that your experience working it, with trash would end up being an inspiration for your a graphic? Well, novel? you look for stories in your own life, and you know when you when you work in a uh, is this a G-rated radio program? I no, guess? you can be oh, as vulgar as you want. Yeah, I can I can go, go clean. I mean, my many. No, no, go R-rated. I think. Does everybody appearance. want R-rated show tonight? <laughs> all right, all right. So when you work in a shit job, you know, you, I mean, you just, uh, you, uh, you acquire stories. And I've always been a storyteller. So as, even as I'm working this thing, I'm, I'm trying to think of a way to turn it into something. I mean, it, there's got to be something better than this. And you just take carry it with them. And eventually, uh, eventually I turn it into a story. So we all know that you wrote My Friend Dahmer, which is about his experience with Jeffrey Dahmer growing up and his, as a friend. But you also have an experience or a story that relates to your job as a trash collector. Oh, the one I told you yesterday? Yeah, um, yeah after uh, I did, I was friends with uh, Dahmer from uh, age 12 to uh, age 18. And two weeks after uh, we graduated high school, he killed his first victim, which is this teenage hitchhiker he picked up near the uh, mall we used to hang out at. And he actually, uh, after he was done with the body, I don't want to get too few details here. Um, he, uh, he carved them up and he put out a lot of his remains in the trash. And about two months later is when I started on the truck. So I was that close to picking up Dahmer's first victim on the curb in the trash. Yeah, welcome to my world. <laughs> so you consider yourself a blue collar artist. What does that mean to you? What does it mean? What does that mean? Um, you know, I came up, uh, it was all DIY with me. I came up through self-publishing and small publishing, and I've always done it by myself. I mean, now I'm with a big shot publisher, who you'll talk to in a minute. But, uh, um, you know, I, I came up from that DIY punk, post-punk uh, beginnings. And, you know, when you come out of Akron, I mean, I'm the first adult male in my family in 100 years that didn't work for a rubber company, didn't make tires. So, you know, it's, that's just the experience that you have. What did you learn about working this shit job about your creative life? That I didn't want to do it anymore. 
I actually keep, uh, I keep a framed photo of the garbage truck that I worked on over my drawing board just as a reminder, you know. Every once in a while when I'm like having a bad day, I look up there, all right, keep drawing or else. <laughs> so is the very act of writing these graphic novels, is that laborious? Sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, indie comics, you know, it's not like Batman or Superman or any of that shit, um, which is produced by, you know, it's corporate product produced by a assembly line of people. With, with, with comics that I do, you know, every line, every word, every shade is put there by hand by me. So it's a very personal work, and that's really the power of these kind of graphic novels, and it's why they're, we're having this explosion of graphic novels right now. I mean, if you're a comics fan, man, it's a great time to be reading comics because every month a new book comes out, and they're amazing. And it's, you know, it's really intimidating when you're trying to make them. It's like, crap, how can I top Dan Klaus or, or you know, Phoebe Glockner or someone like that? It's, but for a comics fan, enjoy it. <laughs> so you said to me, good comics and good cartoons piss people off. What do you mean by that? Did I say that? You said that, yeah. That sounds like a total lie. Um, <laughs> Good, con- good cartoons. Well, yeah, I mean, political stuff. If well, you pissed a lot of people off, though. I did. Longer. I was a political cartoonist. Actually, I started down here. That's why I was down here. I was a political cartoonist for a crappy little paper in West Palm Beach. And, uh, oh, we got some Palm what Beach What was the name there. of the paper? The paper was called The Evening Times. It's not even around anymore. Anyone remember The Evening Times in West Palm Beach? And uh, no. I was fired for, as the editor put it, general tastelessness. So at that point, I went off and started doing my own thing, uh, doing uh, weekly strips for, holy crap, it's like a hurricane. That's Florida for you. Um, Yeah, I remember. And, you know, I I just uh, periodically really would set off little hand grenades with these uh, strips I did. It was fun. I enjoyed it. So, but you also caused some controversy at your college, too, right? Yeah, I was a college cartoonist at uh, Ohio State University. Yeah, Ohio. And uh, there were a couple of cartoons I did where I, I, there was one cartoon I actually had to leave town for a while until uh, tempers cooled off. That was, that was, I did one on the football team. One of the football stars got into some trouble. And I did a cartoon on that, which, uh, you know, I mean, I had some cojones. I didn't really have many brains. I mean, doing a cartoon about a football star at Ohio State, that's not the smartest thing in the world. But so from a young age, I've just always had that ability, you know, to really honk people off. So you were really well known for a while for doing The City. How did you go from The City to graphic novels? Well, newspapers started going out of business. So, um, you know, I had to find something else to do. And I started doing these books, and it turns out I'm a lot better at books than I ever was at that comic strip. So I basically wasted 20 years of my life. And uh, the last five years, I've just been doing books, and, you know, my career's just kind of Wait, you off. mean you, you, re- you wasted 20 years no, of your life? No, it's okay. It's well, okay. what did you learn from that I was process? in the wrong genre. I mean, I'm much better as a graphic novelist than I was as a comic I had fun with it. It was great. You know, it lasted. But I just never, you know, my books are a lot better. I mean, it's just the way it is. But there was also another transitional period that you went through from working on the city to working on graphic novels. You took four years off dealing with cancer. Can you tell us about that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I had uh, cancer for a while, so that was, that was a drag. And uh, actually, actually, after I came out of that is when I decided I've got to get going. I've got to sit down and, and get these books going. And so, you know, it was kind of the payoff at the end of it, but I feel like I've gotten this reboot at age, you know, 50. I'm, a, I'm an overnight sensation after 30 years working, and I, it's like I've gotten a second chance, so... You know, now it's like I've got these best-selling books, and it's fabulous. <laughs> so tell me about the struggle of that, coming out of that, and then finding your stride again within graphic novel. Well, there's no struggle. I mean, drawing is, I mean, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't walk up and down a flight of steps, but I could sit there on the couch and draw comics because it doesn't take, you know, a lot of physical effort. And it was part of the recuperative process, definitely. And, uh, you know, it's something I've always done, so it, it wasn't, there's no struggle. I mean, it's a, it's... It's a pleasure for me to do comics. I mean, it's something I always do. It's like reflexive. Um, and it was part of the, I mean, I don't think I would have made it without comics, so. What do you mean? Well, I, I mean, there was, you know, it kept me going. 
I mean, I, I would do comics. Even in the middle of chemo, I was doing comics. So it was something to look forward to. It was something besides, you know, the ordeal of, of chemo and recovery. So you never doubted yourself along the way? No. To, never? Where? <laughs> Should I have? <laughs> <laughs> true, true. All right, Durf. That does it for Durf. Give it up one more time for Durf. Stay tuned for Charles Kochman and John Luguizamo next. Right now, we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, the Miami Book Fair at Miami-Dade College. Lolo, take it away. Back to our show. Charles Kochman is the editorial director of Abrams Comic Arts and editor of the number one best-selling series, Diary of a Wimpy Kid by Jeff Kinney. Kochman has edited several hundred books for all age groups, including picture books, retrospectives, definitive monographs, award-winning graphic novels, and collections. Prior to Abrams, Kochman spent 12 years as the first editor of licensed publishing at DC Comics and Mad Magazine, where he launched Mad Books. And now, Charles Kochman. What's up? So, Charlie, thank you so much for being here. Uh, hopefully, we'll have an uh, interlude from the rain. But, you know, I want to start because you're clearly at the top of your game. You're the editor of one of the most important comic imprints out there. Uh, but it all started in the Strand with your uncle. Would you say that's correct? Yeah. I don't know if people know. In Brooklyn, in, uh, I grew up in Brooklyn. In um, New York City, there's a bookstore called the Strand Bookstore, which is an amazing bookstore. And that was my uncle's store. Uh, he worked there. And... Between him and my dad, who worked at Sam Goody, was, so I had books and records my whole life. And uh, my uncle was the one who uh, basically made me a reader and told me what to, you know, how to uh, how to look at at books a different way. So as an editor, you know, I'm looking for books that I can acquire, that I could publish, that I think an audience would like. And what he trained me to do is look at the, sh the spaces between the shelves to see what's not published and try to figure out what those books are. Because it's easy to say like. You know, zombies are hot. Let's publish a zombie book. What he tried me to do is, what are the things that you like? And if you like it and you don't see a book on it, then create that. Because if you like it, odds are other people will like it. So how did that impact your role as an editor? Um, basically, you know, trusting your instincts. That's all you could do, you know, and, and figure that you're, you're a proxy for the reader. So, you know, everything that I read, I, I edit a book series called Diary of a Wimpy Kid. I don't know if anybody's read it. Okay. So... So we just published 165 million copies around the world. That's a big milestone for any series. It's crazy. Um, but that was the kind of series, when I first saw it, it wasn't an obvious choice. It wasn't, you know, boys don't read. Um, it was a sort of a hybrid. It wasn't a graphic novel. It wasn't a, um, a comic. But it just made me laugh. And that was why I published it. So 
I think, you know, part of my background allowed me to trust my instincts that if I laughed, then hopefully other people would laugh. It was the book that I wish I had as a kid. So that's really what I like to publish. Why did people, you know, other people might have said no to that book. Why else would they have said no to that? You know, again, you know, there was a big thing that there was, you know, Jeff Kinney talks about that there was this thing called reluctant readers, which really basically means boys. And boys didn't read. And I always felt that boys would read if you gave them something they wanted to read. So, you know, it's hard for a kid these days to read Treasure Island and relate to that. But if you gave them a book about middle school and what it's like to fit in and struggle, they would relate to that and they'd want to read that. So um, I think it was really just about connecting with an audience and creating something that kids would really like. And I think there's, there was nothing like it. So for, for a reluctant reader, a boy, they, you just wanted to give them something that... I don't know if people do, the grown-ups did this, but if you, when I would read novels like Moby Dick or whatever, I'd find the version that had illustrations in it and I'd read to the picture. So I'd like dog ear the page and like 10 pages later, I know there's a illustration. If I can get through those 10 pages, then I'm, I'm moving it forward. And what Jeff figured out with Wimpy Kid is to have a, a little bit of text and an illustration. That was the setup and the punchline was the illustration and it, then it was divided into days. So for, for boys, for reluctant readers, there was a sense of accomplishment in reading it. It wasn't a very big book to read. And he pitched you at, where did he pitch you this? He came up, there was uh, the San Diego Comic Con, which has been going on for 40 years in San Diego. Uh, this was the first New York Comic Con in 2008. And he walked up to me at the booth on the last day at the, probably like the last two hours, and uh, asked if we published books for, um, that were on the web. Uh, and I had published a webcomic called Mom's Cancer, which was a, a graphic novel about this guy's um, journey to dealing with his mother's cancer. Uh, so I sold him a copy of that book. We started talking about it. And he asked if I'd be interested in a webcomic that he wrote for kids. And he pulled out of his bag a little proposal. It was called Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And I love the title. I love the illustration. And I, we just connected. There was something about him. There was something about the way we connected. And um, he tells the story that he left the booth and he called his brother and he said, you know, I just met the, the publisher of my book. And his brother was like, what do you mean? He was like, I met this guy, he's going to publish the book. He's like, well, they all say that. And he said, no, I have a different feeling about this. And I went home that night and I get 100 submissions at these shows. I read it right away and I called him first thing the next morning and I was like, I want to publish your book. And that never happens, but it was really clear, like, this needed to be published. So tell me a little bit about when you were growing up in Brooklyn and how you sort of started to see yourself as an outsider. Because what you're gonna notice in the show tonight is that each one of our guests, in a certain way, their creative journey was about being an outsider. So what did that have, how did that impact your creative journey? You know, I grew up in a neighborhood where, you know, I didn't play sports, I wasn't, you know, if I did play sports, we played baseball, my outs didn't count. So that, that's never a good, and, and that was usually if my, my dad or my brother or whatever were playing, they would say like, don't worry about it, they don't count. Um, so I didn't, I was, I read, I like to read and, you know, I remember, this is a terrible story, but it's true. Um, we used to hang out in the schoolyard every night after, um, after dinner, we'd all expect to, like just everybody in the neighborhood, we'd hang out and I showed up really late one night and everybody was like, oh, where were you? And I was told them I was watching this movie on TV. It was Porgy and Bess, which was a, an opera by, by, uh, George Gershwin. Uh, and they were started laughing. They were like, oh, he's watching Porgy Pig cartoons. And I said, no, no, it's an opera. It's with these black people and they're singing, whatever. And the more I explained it, the worse it got and the more they made fun. And I realized, like, I got to get out of here. So for me, it was, I don't know if anybody saw the movie Saturday Night Fever, but there's a moment, the end of the movie, he's on the train going into Manhattan over the bridge. And for me, that was really symbolic. It was about sort of time to make new connections, new friends, a new life, and wanting something better. And because of the Strand and my dad at Sam Goody's and all that, I knew the city had all that to offer. So for me, it was about making that journey and going into the city and taking advantage of music and theater and concerts and all that, which in Brooklyn, you, you just didn't do that. And that journey seems to really help you find originality in work. But when you had Durf's book come across your desk at first, this is, this is Durf, trashed. I mean, you know, my friend Dahmer, right? right? Tell me about when that came across your desk. So, the same way Jeff Kinney came up to me at uh, Comic-Con, um, uh, Durf's agent came up to me, uh, and he said, I got a book for you I want you to read when you get a chance. And I was like, all right, you know, send it to my office or whatever. He said, all right, you're going to love it. It's about Jeffrey Dahmer. And I'm like, 
There's no way I'm going to publish a book about Jeffrey Dahmer. And he said, no, it's really good. It's by this guy, Gerf Bachter. And I remembered his strip from the Village Voice and New York Press. And I was like, oh, I hate that strip. There's no way I'm going to like that. Um, and I had it sitting on my desk for about two weeks. And I finally, one night, I was like, I just got to get this big package off. It was about that big. And I wanted to get it off my desk. So I'm going to read the first couple of pages and then I'll reject it. And I read the first couple and next, the next thing I knew, I was like halfway through and it wasn't what I thought it was. I thought it was going to be all about him killing people and his crimes and all that. And it was like the secret origin of Jeffrey Dahmer. It was like what he was like in school growing up. Um, and it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. And when I finished it, again, I just knew this, we were going to publish it. I went to my uh, CEO the next morning and I had the, the book and I said, I'm going to bring this to our acquisitions meeting. I'd really love you to read it. And it, you know, first he was like, wait, it's on Jeffrey Dahmer. And I said, trust me, we got to you know, you got to read it. And he read it and loved it. And our acquisition, acquisitions meeting, everybody felt the same way. So what I like about that is, if you would have asked me, I was like, no way I would have published a book on that subject or a book by that author. And I like surprising myself and the fact that I could change my mind based on what I read. For the people out there who, you know, are creative, what's an important lesson and takeaway from that experience? I think, you know, don't go by your first reaction. I think it's everything, you know, to have your own, like to make your own, um, you know, sort of make your own decisions, make your, come to your own conclusions, but also trust your instincts when, you know, even though I, I was like, there was no way I was going to do it, as I read it, I was open. I think, you know, I guess the, the, the lesson is just to be open to what you read and what you see and who you talk to, because you just don't know. But you also know John, right? How do you know John? John Leguizamo, how do you know yeah. him? So I grew up in Brooklyn, he was in Queens, and we had mutual friends, and we just used to um, hang out in the city and you know, either go to comedy clubs or you know, go to movies. I remember going to see Pee-, Pee Wee's Big Adventure together, and he became obsessed talking in Pee Wee voice. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it was just that, you know, hanging out. But then we lost touch. He became really famous, obviously, and we totally lost touch until about a year and a half ago, And one of the editors that I work with came up to me, this guy, David Cashin, and he got a submission from John's agent and said, you know, uh, to do a graphic novel of the Ghetto Clown. And David came to me and said, do you know, you know, John Leguizamo is? And I thought he was asking if I knew him. And I I said, I know who he is, but I also know him, but I doubt he'll remember me. It was like 30 years ago. Um, So we had the meeting and I walked in and John was there and he was like, what are you doing here? So, and I just sort of explained what I did and that was it. We just picked up our friendship from where we left off 30 years ago. I think what you're going to see when we bring them all together again, that they really all seem to like each other a lot. They know each other. It seems like a family over there. I li- <laughs> so that's it for Charlie. Thank you so much. We're going to bring them back. Give it up. Big round of applause. Thank you so much. John Leguizamo is a celebrated Colombian-American actor, producer, comedian, playwright, and screenwriter. His new graphic memoir, Ghetto Clown, depicts his early years in Queens, his salvation through acting and writing, working with stars such as Al Pacino and Patrick Swayze, and with directors such as Baz Luhrmann and Brian De Palma, his offstage life in love and marriage, and his journey of moving beyond self-doubt and beyond the doubters to claim some happiness. And now, give it up for John Liguizamo. Thank you, thank you. What's up, everybody? How many people are excited to see John on the stage right now? Liars, you just didn't want to be in the rain. That's why everybody's here. Uh (laughs) <laughs> they found a dry spot. Yeah. So let's start with your new book, The uh, Ghetto Clown, your first book, right? My, my first graphic novel? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. So let's let you, I remember we were talking and you said that life doesn't fit the three-act structure. 
but you still have to find a way to tell a story. How difficult was it for you to find the narrative and the structure to tell your story? Well, first let me start by saying that I'm, I'm a huge fan of graphic novels and always have been. Uh, Persepolis, uh, Fun Home, my friend Jeffrey Dahmer, I, I just thought they were like such beautiful ways of telling a, a, a personal story in a different kind of way with pictures, which is easier to read anyway. And uh, when I started doing Ghetto Clown as a graphic novel, it, it, yeah, life doesn't really fit in a three-act structure, which is what you're used to telling stories, so it takes a lot longer to crack that career and life telling story uh, without it becoming like, you know, just like a obvious memoir or a self-congratulatory kind of piece of work. And how long did that take you? It took you years through performance, through working yeah. on this. Tell us about that struggle there. Yeah. Well, Ghetto Clown took me about eight years to, to put together. I traveled to colleges across the country trying to figure out how to tell my life story in a way that could be inspiring. You know, not just to tell my story, that's not interesting, but I, I wanted it to be an, insp an inspiration. I wanted to, to write, I wanted it to be an example of what not to do. What did you want to inspire in people? To understand that an artist's journey is, is full of pitfalls and, and, and peaks and valleys, and there's going to be a lot of, uh, of self-doubt, a lot of uh, failure, <laughs> and... Uh, and you got to get beyond that. You got to enjoy it's just the process, not not the end result. So that's what I was hoping the the, the graphic novel would be for kids, you know, especially kids who want to be artists. And I certainly <laughs> think that's the case when you read the book. You do and feel inspired. Take me back to 2011, though, when you're on Broadway and you realize the graphic novel was the form to tell your story. Yeah, well, I was doing it on Broadway and... Uh, I just felt like how I want this to become a, a book that kids read, and I and I and I did my other plays, Mambo Mouths, Pick Rama, and Freak, as as plays, but the regular person can't really read a play structure. So I, I had just seen Persepolis, and I was like, I want that's a perfect format for Ghetto Clown because sort of the one man show. I do a lot of characters, and I travel through a lot of different time zones, and. And it's hard to capture that it, just to read, but in a graphic novel you have images, it, it's, it's a perfect marriage. So tell me, you know, one thing that we've been talking with Durf and Charlie about is that this sense of an outsider. You know, you're Colombian, you, grew up, you were born in Colombia. Colombian Puerto Rican. Colombian Puerto yeah. Rican, you grew up in Queens. What, were you an outsider and how did that impact your creative journey? Well, well, Queens, when I was there, we were like the second Latin family there, so, so we were like, kind of like pioneers, and there was a lot of white flight, and, and I mean, like all the white people were leaving, and, uh, and you know, I, I was a teenager, and you know, they were, the Italians would be like, hey, you better stay away from my daughter, hey, forget about it, hey, and the Irish too, hey, she'll be naked, you can hear my daughter, you can just smack your town. The Jamaicans said, yeah, you better be touching me, daughter, but if you tell me something, I don't want to So, you know, my, I picked up an ear for accents, and I had to be funny to not get beat up, and, and that's how it kind of influenced me, to my, my humor and everything. Tell me more about, and you talk about this in the book, you talk about this in your, in your one-act play, I mean, your, your play. Tell me about how comedy for you was survival. It was huge, man. I mean, comedy was everything for me. It was my defense mechanism. Uh, you know, I grew up in a tough neighborhood, and uh, there was a lot of beatings, and, you know, I had a lot of fights. Well, not fights. Let me be correct. I got beat, beat up a lot. Uh, <laughs> by every ethnic group. Even my own people beat me up. Uh, and so I started being really funny to keep people at bay, to... You know, you give me enough time to run away, and and that's how I developed my humor. And I, I needed it at home too. At home, it was kind of a tough home life that was that wasn't very dissimilar to to the neighborhood. So I had to be funny at home to defend myself as well. In the book, you you know, you, your father is a huge part of that get a ghetto clown, but he also influenced your creative life. What was his influence on your creative journey? Well, my I guess. <laughs> Uh, not to fail, I get a beat down, so that kind of helped. Uh, it, it was mostly, he, he had, you know, immigrant mentality, which is, 
just work, constantly work and and not not be afraid of sacrifice, which is the kind of things the immigrant always teaches you is is you sacrifice everything, you know, and uh, and work like like hell. And so I, I kind of adopted all those values. Great. Tell me about the scene that happens in the book in Ghetto Clown when you're on the train and you try to get on the PA system and tell joke. Why was that so important to you, that scene? Well, that, that was a that was kind of basically the first time I performed in public in a way. And uh, my friend Ray, I don't know, he, he, he thought, I guess, he was going to turn into an open mic night on the subway. And uh, I was 16, and, and we broke into the conductor's booth in, in the number seven train going to Manhattan. I remember it was a summer. And uh, we kicked the door, and I grabbed the mic, and I started doing beats like... <laughs> And uh, doing voices, I say, boy, I say, boy, you're chicken hawk, boy. Ah, g -g -g -g, one grabs me nuts. Ah, g -g 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 -g. And, uh, and the cops grabbed us, handcuffed us, took us to 110th Street precinct. And, uh, and it was my, I guess it was my first bad review. So part of your journey in the book, too, is to open doors for Latino actors and Latino creators. Tell me about the scene where you were told to stay out of the sun. Why was that so important <laughs> for you? Well, you know, when, when, I, when I came up, it was really tough to be a Latin actor. I mean, there, was, there, weren't, there wasn't that much opportunity, and, and I guess my grandfather was trying to protect me by, you know, don't stay out of the sun, mijo. Don't even eat dark food. You know, walk on the chaitous side of the street. Because, you know, they just didn't cast... Latin people, and the darker you were, my agents would tell me to, you know, change my name to something Italian sounding, and I thought like Guzam was not Italian sounding enough, <laughs> you know, because it was hard. And uh, all the auditions I would go to were all drug dealers and murderers, and and that's what I would go to. So, but I think having to deal with Hollywood, yeah, Hollywood was good for me because it made me write, made me, made me create my own work, made me do my own thing. And I think all that rejection really made me really strong and, and put me in a path where I was self-generating. And I think that's a really good place to ask this question because I think a lot of creatives, when they're working, they think it's all rose colors and it, it, there's not a struggle. But in order for you to create in the book, there's a pattern of sort of a depression, a struggle. Yeah. Can you tell me about how that's important to your creative journey? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we all deal with depression, and I think Americans don't deal with depression and sadness as well. It's not kind of accepted. It's like, Americans, we all got to be happy, and we all got to be chasing that American dream, but depression is a part of life, and it's usually a rebirth. At least for me, it's always been a rebirth. It's, a, it's a, sort of a chance to reboot and, uh, and figure myself out. And, and every time I, usually it was when I broke up, in a, when I had a, deep long relationship usually at the end of that or I, I, I would like be depressed for months and I'd come out of it with a one man show and I'd write and write like crazy and just to, to get a to get a perspective of my life so did that become a part a necessary part of your creative journey I hope not but uh, <laughs> I mean I'm, I'm happily married I don't want that to break up so I could have another one man show I don't think <laughs> I don't want to sacrifice my life that way no I, I, it, was, it was a pattern back then. I mean, now I write a lot slower. It, it takes me a lot longer. You know, I'm, I'm much more methodical. Like, I'm working on um, my next one-man show, Land History for Dummies. Yeah, that's all of you. <laughs> you know, and it's been like a 15-year process of doing the research, and now I just started two years ago touring with it, and, um, you know, to take my time developing it. How do you think you got through some of those hard times where you were struggling to get the next job or to, yeah. you know, find the way to pay for your survival, to be your, to create? How did you get through those moments? Well, luckily for me, I, I was never searching for fame or, or power or money. Now I am. Uh, but back then I wasn't, and I, I think that really helped me, man. I was just wanted to, to be the best at what I at acting and and comedy and writing. So I was just go wherever and perform to wherever for no money. You know, I didn't eat much, 
just you know the fact that I got a chance to go up there and test out what I was working on was was enough for me. And you, but you failed a lot when you tested. Is that a part of the journey too? Oh or? yeah, man, I, I I failed all the time. Uh, I don't know how I got past that, but yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I, I was just hoping to get better, man. And that, that every time I got a little bit better, that was enough inspiration for me to keep going. In the beginning, what was a moment that you had besides the train where you realized, oh, I, I wish I did that better. I wish I did that differently. I wish I changed this approach. I, I always feel like that. <laughs> I just shot John Wick 2 this week and already I'm going, God, I wish I'd done that scene better. I wish I had done that. You know, it's always in my head. For John Wick 2 or? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the last question here is that you, you talk about this creative journey. You talk about the ups and downs. But the consistent thread, the thing that Cedar ties it all together is your wife in the book, Ghetto Clown. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about her role in your creative journey. Well, you know, I, I lucked out. I, I, you know, I had a first marriage that was, uh, I guess, a starter marriage. And... Uh, that was that was a right rough passage of to the next level. You know, I, w women have always been sort of my my muses. You know, they they influence me and nurture me. And and I finally found my wife, who's my soulmate, and they, and she like totally gets what I'm after, and she supports me, and and has always been there for me, even you know through the hard times and the great times. She's always there. I mean, there's never a judgment. There's never a an expectation of. It's just, she totally accepts me as I am, which is like, you know, a miracle in a way. Great. Give it up one time for John Leguizamo. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to bring him back in a couple minutes. <laughs> Stay tuned to hear our guests talk more about their creative journeys. Miami Book Fair's official bookseller, Books and Books, was named the 2015 Publishers Weekly Bookstore of the Year. Remember to get your book signed after the show. Lolo, take it away. Uh, please. Everybody, remember there's another part of the show, so don't get up and walk away. stage, Durf Backdurf, Charles Kochman, and John Liguizamo. Give it up one more time for our three incredible guests, Durf, Charlie, and John. There we go. So thank you all for being here on the Working Poet Radio Show at the Miami Book Fair. So, John and Durf, you've been working in various ways with Charlie. Now that you have him here and the creative process is over, what do you want to say to him? He wants to do a third book. <laughs> Mike's not on. <laughs> Just when he's that's what I want to tell him. Not working either, I don't. 
So nothing you want to say to him? What about this creative process? What it was like working with Charlie? Or working with in relationship with Charlie at the imprint? Well, Charlie kept trying to pawn his book, Jeffrey, uh, my friend Jeffrey Dahmer on me. and go, I don't want to read about a killer. I don't want to read that book. He said, you got to read this fantastic. I don't want to read about Jeffrey Dahmer. She gave me the book. I go home. I start reading it. I can't stop reading it. It's a phenomenal piece of literature. And, uh, and I was like, I want to work with this guy who, who helped make this book happen. And I want, I hopefully ghetto clown will be as good as uh, my friend Jeffrey Dahmer. And that's, Aww. I do. I mean it. You know, what I mean it. They both have the same kind of ending too. <laughs> Similar, I guess. Yeah. I'm still alive though. <laughs> So, so am I, I think. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> so you all work in comedy in some way or the other in various different ways. You have serious roles too. But how str- much of a struggle is it to make people laugh on the page compared to other forms? And how do you focus on making people laugh on the page as well? How do I fuck? Well, I don't know. Uh, you got me. Um, it's not, I mean, it's not hard. I've always done it, so it's just kind of natural. I mean, I was drawing lame little comic strips when I was five years old, so people keep buying the books, so somebody must like it. I, except Dom. I mean, Dahmer is not really a comedy, obviously. But. No, that wasn't really comedy. <laughs> We're switching gears here. Um, but the other two are, so yeah. I mean, I, I try to make myself laugh. I, I never like really look to make other people laugh. I just write for myself in a way that's how I create my work and then hopefully it'll touch other people so tell me a little bit about uh, you know your creative journeys together how do you guys see similarities between yourselves and your own personal stories what are your connections with each other well I, you know Charlie told you we met in Brooklyn because he loves talking about Brooklyn that's all he ever talks about is there Brooklyn in the house <laughs> anybody <laughs> Don't, yeah, said, I just... don't encourage him. No, you can go to the moon. There's yeah. always Brooklyn in the house. Today in a conversation, he thought Wichita was near Kalamazoo. It's not? <laughs> it's, it's on the other side of those left mountains from New York. Everything on the, le- the end of the country is on Or as I point out, where the refugee camp will be when Manhattan is flooded in like 20 years. That's where we're going to stick all yeah. you guys. Nice. You'll have some nice beachfront property over there in, <laughs> in Wichita. But I met Charlie back when I was 19 years old, 18, and, and in Brooklyn. And, and I remember we hit it off really well because he loved comedy and he loved Woody Allen. He loved the Marx Brothers and it was the same things that I loved. And, and then we, we lost touch. And then I was, I was getting my, my graphic novel idea out there and, and there was Charlie in the room and he looked the same. Maybe a few pounds heavier, but not much. <laughs> More than a few. <laughs> Well, what do you guys remember about each other growing up? Say what? What do you guys remember about each other? That he had a great sense of humor, man. He was a really funny dude, and, and how much he loved comics and, uh, and, and Woody Allen and Marx Brothers. That's all he ever talked about. And Charlie Chaplin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he still, that's all he talks about. And he's how old? <laughs> well, what I remember was you were driven, and they were like... Where I lived, there was nobody who was going to be famous or anything. Like, that wasn't even a possibility. But you had that thing because you were just going to do it. And I remember you did a show. It was like maybe one of your first shows at like PS 121 or something. PS 122, yeah, yeah, on 9th Street. Yeah, and I just like, this guy has something that I've never seen before. But it was more than just like hanging out with somebody who was like your funny friend who is in the neighborhood. There There was, you know a work ethic and a real drive so I mean if anybody was going to make it from that those days in that group it was you I got nothing it's true <laughs> <laughs> he got an awe that's good man. Not, nobody else got an awe and then he left us all behind <laughs> 30 years later so my book. the quest to be original is something you guys are all you guys are all originals the imprint is original the work that you guys have done is original Tell me about how difficult it is to find that way to f- be original, to find your true self in your work. What do you do, Durf? Well, you're pretty original just by who you are. <laughs> in your Durfness. <laughs> his own Durfness. <laughs> okay. In his own Durfdom. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's like any other. You just work your craft, you know. And and if if you set out with the goal of being different than what you you know every what everybody else is doing, then you just keep working it till you find your way. It's trial and error, really. And some people have it, some people don't, I suppose. But um, it took a long time. It does take courage, though. To I mean, I, I see a lot of people trying to pursue like how to make the audience happy, how to please the audience, things that are going to be mainstream or, or you're searching some kind of commercial success. That's a real recipe for not doing something original in my book. I mean, to do something original, you got to really stay true to yourself, and that takes a lot of courage. I have one observation about both of them, and also I mentioned Jeff Kinney before. There's a thing. Anybody know Malcolm Gladwell, you know, the, the writer? He talks about doing something for a thousand hours, you know, before right, you do of course, it. Yeah. And you guys, Jeff, I mean, you've all just worked your ass off. I mean, you, you know, you were constantly acting and taking classes and doing it. You've been doing a strip for however long, and then you do, you know, how long did it take you to do trash from start to finish? Uh, about eleven months. Yeah, I mean that's mm-hmm. nonstop, and that was all you were doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, still pretty freaking fast, though. That was way too fast. <laughs> My, Does fuck, that my fucking editor was like cracking the whip, you know. <laughs> but wait, did, did, the, did the 11 months include the time when I didn't get back to you on your... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you were dealing with some other asshole's book, as yeah. I recall. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> but the like, reality Where are my is, edits? Where are my edits? I'm busy. The, the reality is, as you're trying to be original, you do still have to please an audience. You do have to... You still want commercial success. How do you balance those things? No, I, I don't know if you're, if, if you're searching to please the audience, but you want your material to communicate. You want to be able to, that, that they're getting your point across. I think that's, that's more what you care about. I mean, that's what I care about is, is, are they understanding what I'm trying to say? I'm not trying to please them. I just want them to understand my message. Is my message clear enough? Is my premise sharp enough? Is my theme t- all throughout the, the piece? That's a good memoir comic. I see a lot of bad ones, but that's that, uh, that was a good one, John. It Thank really you. Is. It really is. Well, name some I of mean, the bad ones. Come on, name not, names. No, come no, on. No, no. Oh, come on. That's, that's not. It's not an easy thing to do. I mean, yeah, it's really not. Well, we also had two really good artists working. I mean, that's the difference too. Is that you know, Durf is writing and illustrating his own book. John wrote his book, broke it down, worked with his editor David on that, and then we had two artists who had to visualize all that, and it's you know, like a whole team to do it. Right, that's a little different, right? Yeah. I mean, in terms, they had to draw my words as opposed to when you do it all right. in one. Right. Yeah. Well, they, well, I see them together. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to get somebody. You have to communicate with somebody yeah. else to get them to see your vision. Where yeah. my twisted vision is all. It's right all there. in one. Yeah, it's right there. It's interesting. Yeah, because I had to like give them photos, addresses to Google to see the locations I was talking about. So I gave them a ton of addresses, photos, movies my books, my plays, yeah. and I would highlight the things that I wanted them to study. And then you see the graphic novel, and it's like all that interstitial stuff that, because that, they took the addresses and the photos, and all of a sudden that photo comes to life in that address, and it's crazy, man, because it's like my memory, but it's, but it's in a graphic novel. So when you think back on that stuff, are you thinking your original memories now, or are you thinking their, their versions of it? Combination? Well, I'm not crazy, so I, I, can, st- <laughs> I can still <laughs> differentiate between my real memories. And the other voices that you hear in your head. <laughs> so finally, one last question before we have a game here real quick. What is your role in inspiring that next generation of creatives that are coming up? The, the Johns, the Durfs, the Charlies that are growing up. What is your role... And inspire them, or maybe you don't have. Oh, a screw role. the next generation, man! I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, and let them find their own way. You know, I worked too hard. I want. <laughs> and he's got two kids, and he, and he means it. He means it. He's not joking. <laughs> I, I I do want to inspire the next generation, though. I I, I do. I just, uh, I mean, Ghetto Clown. I wrote it to inspire artists who like. Like myself, like my brother wanted to be an artist and, and it never came true for him, you know. And, uh, you know, I just want to be able to tell him, you know, being an artist is a really rough journey, but I want, I want you to pursue it. I don't want you to give up. And Charlie, you come at it from a different angle. You're always nurturing people to create, right? Yeah, well, I'm, I publish 
adult books and coffee table books, but I also do a lot of graphic novels. Adult books. Adult, I want to see those adult <laughs> hey, books. I haven't seen any of these. Yeah. Bring out the adult books. What I meant to say, <laughs> I do graphic novels on the adult list that I work on and also on the kids list. So there's two different kinds. And um, what I'm always looking for is things, you know, that are going to challenge kids. Uh, you know, I have a, a series coming out that uh, is by a guy named Eddie Pittman. It's called Red's Planet. It's a three books about a girl who accidentally gets abducted by a UFO and lands in space. And this is just going to introduce kids to this whole other world and his characters are amazing. So for me, it's like, I want to see something I haven't seen. And, and Eddie's manuscript was like that. So I always look for just stuff I haven't seen that I hope they'll be excited by. That's great. Derp, has anyone ever come up to you and said, you've inspired me? Have you, uh, you've... Yeah, yeah, no, it's really cool. When, John Wayne Gacy. Who? Right? Who? <laughs> Um, you know, always with the serial killer joke. Um, yeah, it's really cool when that happens. You know, I mean, if, if you do good work, I think you know. It, it, at least I thought this as I was working in obscurity for many years. If you do good work, eventually some people will find it, and you know, it's just you have to have that belief, or or you'll give up. You heard that? If you do good work, people will find you. So now, what we're gonna do though, we're gonna play a quick little game here to close out the night. Now, I don't know if you know, but. We did have some, one of our panelists make some news about criticism of a certain presidential candidate. Uh, so you want to exploit it? What's that? You want to exploit that situation? Uh, no, I want to let them all know about it. So basically what we did is we have this little game that BuzzFeed created, right? They have these quotes. And what your job is to do is to say, is this Donald Trump or is this Lucille Bluth from Arrested Development? So, basically, Guillermo, you're going to give them the uh, paddles, right? They're under my seat. Oh, they are? Oh, they're under their seats. Oh, look at that. So, basically, <laughs> our announcer over there, <laughs> our announcer, Guillermo Canciobello, is going to read these quotes, and we're going to have John, Charlie, and Durf say who they are, and then we'll reveal who this person is after the end of each quote. So, Guillermo, take it away. I've never seen a thin person drinking Diet Coke. That is, I've never seen a thin person drinking Diet Coke. We have John for Lucille, we have Durf for Lucille, and we have Charlie for Donald Trump. Oh, yeah. He's, He's got a Hitler mustache, too. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, Charlie wins. This is Donald Trump. Oh, get out. Oh, yeah, and there are prizes when you win. So whoever wins gets a prize. It's amazing stuff. <laughs> They're building a wall to separate the U.S. from the immigrants, which was my idea. That is, they're building a wall to separate the U.S. from the immigrants, which was my idea. Come so on, we got John, we got... What is it? Oh, we got Trump, we got Lucille from Durf, and we got Trump from Charlie. This is actually Lucille Bluth. No. <laughs> Seriously? Well, according to BuzzFeed. She's writing Trump's campaign? She is. <laughs> How could two people be that stupid? She inspired him. <laughs> Suddenly, playing with yourself is a scholarly pursuit. One more time, Guy. What? Suddenly, playing with yourself is a scholarly pursuit. That was you. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, playing with yourself is a scholarly pursuit. John, what do you got there? Lucille, we got Durf with Donald, and we got Charlie with Lucille. And this is actually Bluth. This is yeah. Lucille Bluth. So who won that one? I no? I got, yeah, two and one. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, we got one more. If you're worried about criticism, sometimes a diet is the best defense. What? If you're worried about criticism, sometimes a diet is the best defense. I, think, I think this one is... Who do you got? Lucille. Lucille. I'm gonna go. We got Trump, and that is Lucille Bluth. I don't know who won the game, but they all win. Charlie won. Charlie won. So we do have some gifts here for you. Where are the gifts? We have gifts. We have for Durf. We have biodegradable trash bags. <laughs> for 
our Charlie, we have red pens. Did he ever use a red? He never used a red yeah. pen, did he? Oh, yeah. He yeah. did? No, yeah, I saw a lot sure, of red yeah. pen marks on my book. Like a legit, <laughs> legit red Crossing pen. Crossing out. What is this yeah. hell? What the fuck I try, is this I work in blue. I try to work in blue pencil. And then we have a really big fan of the Mario Brothers movie. Here is Luigi. <laughs> oh, yeah. Woo! So give it up for our three amazing guests. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have listened to the Working Poet Radio Show. I would like to thank our sponsors, the Miami Book Fair at Miami Dade College, Abrams Books, Books and Books, Director of Programming, Lizette Mendez, Swamp Coordinator, Nicole Smith. Give it up for these people. These people are working crazy. DJ Lolo for providing some great music. All the guests. I've got to thank my producer, Marcy Calabri... Marcy. Give it up for Marcy right there. Marcy put this all together. She made everything sure that run. And give it up for Guillermo. And give it up for yourselves, too. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate you being a great audience. Thank you so much. You have just listened to the Working Poet Radio Show. You can see these authors at other Miami Book Fair events this weekend. Music provided by DJ Lolo, founder of Sweat Records. We'll be back in Miami on April 30th with the Dark Noise Collective, six astounding young multi-genre poets. And if you would like to bring the Working Poet Radio Show to your city, Find us online at www.theworkingpoetradioshow.com. Lolo. Hi, everybody. This is Lisa. I want you to know that tonight at 9 p.m. after Afro Better plays, we're going to have the Rock Bottom Remainders in concert right at this venue. And the party is going to be outside. A Books and Books Cafe has brought over a delicious bread, and we'll have beer from Peroni and free Prosecco. Also, to let you know that the signing for John Leguizamo and Durf are going to, is going to be inside where Guillermo and Lolo are right now because we don't want our guests to get wet. So if you just want to line up right here in front of the stage, it's probably the easiest way to do it. Lolo's going to start playing some music and we'll see you back for the Rock Bottom Remainders after Afro Beta. Thank you.